These gulls are dining on a smorgasbord of fish in a tidal pool. The fish are small, just the right size to fill a bill or to stuff the stomachs of other fish, much bigger, lurking nearby. Find the gulls and you find the lunkers. So goes the fisherman's gospel. The seacoast is the magic and magnetic realm of birds, tides, fish, tranquility, and turmoil the surge of the unpredictable that captivates a special kind of fisherman, the surfcaster. On all the seacoasts of America, and many other countries as well, surfcasting is a popular and challenging sport. It produces a tremendous variety of fish, from whiting of only a few ounces to sharks of several hundred pounds. These surfcasters are fishing on the outer banks of North Carolina a strip of barrier islands that jut like an elbow into the Atlantic. I'm Homer Circle, and we've come here to try out an innovative technique of surf casting. Even if you don't fish the ocean, I think you'll find it fascinating to watch and maybe a bit hard to believe. In the surf, extremely long casts are vital. Waters deep enough for fish may be very far out. Today we'll find out how the average surf caster can increase his distance by at least 50%. For many years, Ken Lauer has been a fishing guide on the Outer Banks, and he's eager to learn how this new technique works. The man who developed it is John Holden. John is from England, and he's here to share his knowledge with Americans. He calls this technique the power cast or pendulum cast. It's not that I'm familiar with. It works with either spinning or conventional tackle. His sinker swings out and back like a pendulum, and then he makes a smooth forward cast, rotating his body toward the water. He teaches his technique in three steps, starting with the ordinary style of surf casting. John, how about going through the whole procedure for me and just how you got to this cast, but do it with a spinning tackle, something that I can relate to. Let's, let's trade rods. Right. I'll just show you how the cast built up from the original overhead style okay. of casting. Let me back out of the way a little bit. Yeah. This is the way that uh, most people cast. Probably cast the same here as they do in England. Just hold the rod up where you're kind of standing there and the way it goes, that, that kind of style. Or maybe uh, you're going to take a run up, run down the beach and cast. Let's see why the, the overhead cast doesn't work. You've got a very limited arc of movement. That means you've got to cast very powerfully and very quickly, because if you don't, it, it's all happened. Probably more important than that, you're not using all of these muscles. This is where the power comes from. This is important, but not... Pretty. Now the second step, so which is simply these, a modification of the first. Cast, you can learn quite easily. This doesn't work. What we need to do is extend the arc of movement of the rod. Now that's very easily done. Just drop the sinker down on the ground. The rod tip is fairly close so to the beach. A, a javelin position then. Yeah, that's right. Just note that my, my left elbow is, is up high. That's an important point. And my head is, is round this way. It doesn't want to be there. You pull the rod through as if it was a javelin and just flick it over with your arms, just like John, I saw that you have got more distance with that style of casting than you did with the first one. Now, if I understand you correctly, I'm going to have to learn step one and step two before I go to the ultimate step three and really get into your style of casting. Is that it? Master the off-the-ground technique, and then just add the pendulum on. It's, it's so easy. It's kind of, well, it's just an anti-climax, really. Well, how about going through step three, and then I'll have some idea of what it is I'm going to have to do. Right. Instead of casting with the sinker on the ground as we did before. This time I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to swing it in a pendulum arc until it comes somewhere over my shoulder. And then I'm going to just fall back to the original method we've been using. Push it out, back in. Oh. John, with that tailwind, you must have put that out there about 800 feet. No, not quite. I don't think so. Whenever John is no, on the beach casting, fishermen gather to watch. Seeing okay, is believing. 
and all of them want to know exactly how he's getting such amazing distance. Look at that thing. What are you trying to do, John? I saw it, but I didn't realize what you were doing. What you're trying to do is solve the main problem of casting, which is where everything's trying to go different ways. You know, you're going one way, the rod another, the sink the other, and overrun results. Just putting the whole thing into a smooth sequence, making it work as a system. Adding the pendulum on is just an extension of casting off the ground. Your rod angle's the same. Where you're, you're here with the sinker on the ground, you're just gonna pick it up like so and push it away, pull it back, and then you do your cast. And you find that what happens is the sinker's gonna be here, and this rod goes down more or less to where it would have been for off the ground, and then the cast is just the same as it was. So, out, in, cast. Oh, man. <laughs> Where did it go? You're trying to set up back home. Oh. I've got that. You can almost count your way through it. It says one, two, three. I think I'm going to quit fishing and just practice. No, it's, you got it's, me hung up on this now. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> it's, it's the technique. It's no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody who fishes, no matter what he does, always wants to cast a little bit further. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. That's right, isn't it? It's I mean, if, you could, if you could cast two miles, you'd want to do two oh, miles yeah. and one yard, and then some guy would want to come along and cast two miles and two yards, Very and you just keep going. The, the women have a hard time casting like the men. They're trying to put the muscle into it with the yeah. small amount of effort you're using here. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. To problem. help these anglers get the hang of the cast, John takes them through the movements. He favors a rod about 11 and a half feet long, and a sinker weighing three to six ounces must be used. The average surf caster can pick up the basics of the pendulum cast in just an hour or two. All right. You can feel the extenuation of the whole rod, everything. I have a conventional reel at home, and this is farther than I've been able to throw that thing, and I've had that for a year and a half now. I've been beating my brains up for 20 years. Now I'm learning how to cast. <laughs> that's, that's neat. All in one afternoon. One final note. The pendulum cast develops tremendous power, and when spinning tackle is used, a band-aid should be worn on the line finger to prevent cuts. With John Holden's technique, most casters hit 120 yards, and John himself, well, his casts are headed for England. And this is some country. Yes, it is. Big country. How much of this do you have to cover? I have about 2,400 square miles in my district. 2,400 square miles? Yes. That includes... Uh, a lot of roadless areas in uh, one of the largest contiguous wilderness expanses in uh, the 48 lower states. Uh, we have parts of the... Dave Burgonia has the kind of job that many outdoorsmen dream about. He's a game warden for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. His district includes a part of the spectacular Absarca Mountain Range. Dave, how, just how important do you think a game warden's job is? Well, uh, I feel it's pretty very important uh, we have a lot of responsibilities not just game law enforcement but uh the, the Wyoming game warden is also charged with uh, game management and uh, uh no little thing is our game damage responsibilities in wyoming well, you know, game i'm grits gresham and today on sports of field we'll take an inside look at one of the most effective well, conservation agencies is. in the nation We'll discover how the people of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department do the important work of protecting wildlife and the wild land it lives on. I'm riding with Dave on one of his regular patrols to experience for myself a day in the life of a Wyoming game warden. The time is mid-October, and the hunting seasons on deer, elk, and other big game are well underway. During these seasons, Dave makes the rounds of mountain hunting camps. Got a nice deer there. How you doing? Pretty good, you? 
Well, not too bad. <laughs> well, fellas, could I look at some license, please? That's for the big elk there. My dad's got the tag with the meat. And I didn't get an elk. Is that right? Yeah, but I get this. Got a nice deer. Yeah, I prefer the venison okay. anyway. That's all right. Wyoming has excellent populations of wildlife for several reasons. It's a large state with few people, and much of it is public land, where wildlife is protected from unrestrained commercial development. But just as important is the careful management of wildlife by the Game and Fish Department. Because of this, most species of big game are actually more abundant now than they were 50 years ago. Back then, they had been decimated by poorly regulated shooting. In 1980, hunters bagged more than 18,000 elk in Wyoming, nearly triple the number bagged in 1930. The department has purchased lands that elk use for winter range to protect them from development. In the same 50-year period, the annual bag of moose has increased from only 86 to more than 1,500. And the bag of deer has increased from 819 to more than 61,000. Bighorn sheep populations are high in most areas where suitable habitat exists. In a few areas, they multiply to the maximum numbers the natural food can sustain. Wyoming is one of the last refuges for several rare species. The department works to protect the bald eagle, the grizzly bear, and others as well. The grizzly population exists in and around Yellowstone Park, and it's one of only two populations remaining in the lower 48 states. Grizzlies are symbols of the wilderness, of the struggle to conserve wildlife. The department also works to protect waterfowl, and many of its programs benefit non-game species as well, like the yellow-headed blackbird. It's responsible for wildlife not only on public lands, but also on farms and ranches, and so it strives to maintain good relations with landowners. Rancher Tom Wright tells me how it does this. Uh, Usually before they set the season, in addition to the public meeting that is usually held in each of these areas, uh, the local warden will usually go around and ask a number of the landowners, what is the game situation and how, what do they feel should be done for the next year? Uh, he gets a wide diversity of opinion, of course. Tom, you mean the department checks with ranches to see how many animals should be taken off the ranches? Well, in a, in a general way, yes. Usually they ask, you know, how did they feel last year's season went? What do we think the game populations are looking like? Then they usually use this in cooperation with their more formalized surveys, mm -hmm. but it does give the landowner a chance there to have some say as to what he thinks the day-to-day -day situation really is. And there's obviously pretty good cooperation between landowners and the uh, Wyoming Game Department. Yes, I would say the general relationship has been very really good between landowners and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and probably has gotten better in the last 10-year period. Well, one of the things that seems to be unique about Wyoming, at least I don't think any other states have it, is this business of uh, the rancher getting a certain amount of money if each animal is taken off. There's a coupon on the bottom of the li each license that's sold, and when an animal is killed on private land, that coupon is supposed to go to the landowner. He, in turn, summarizes these and sends them into the state. And I think the current rate is about $8 per animal uh, that's killed on private land. This is probably does not cover the total cost of running an animal, but it's some recompense. Mm -hmm. Most of the public lands in Wyoming are mountains. The numerous species of wildlife that require a prairie habitat at lower elevation are found mostly on private lands. This small herd of antelope is grazing on a ranch in the eastern part of the state. Large herds of other species, such as deer and elk, may move onto ranch lands in the winter when snow is deep and food scarce in the high country. And ranchers may not always regard them as welcome visitors. If wildlife harms a crop, the Game and Fish Department may be required to pay damages to the landowner. Earl Thomas, director of the department, makes sure his workers do everything possible to keep depredations by wildlife to a minimum. Take a look at On this winter morning, he's joining Warden Barry Floyer to deal with a problem caused by antelope on farmland in Laramie County. We're going to take off here from Burns. Thomas does not spend all his working hours behind the desk. He makes frequent trips in the field with his wardens and biologists to get a better understanding of the problems they face. They'll locate the herd of antelope from the air. 
The landowner has reported damage to strips of winter wheat he's planted. The wheat stays green after the prairie grasses are dry and brown, and so it's highly attractive to the antelope. This problem is common in eastern Wyoming, and one way the department copes with it is to chase the offending antelope from the crops by making low passes with an airplane. This herd will travel several miles to a section of public land. Eventually, it may return to the wheat strips, and if it does, the department's plane will resume the chase. The department also manages the state's fisheries. Wyoming has nearly 5,000 lakes and 20,000 miles of fishing streams, among them such famous rivers as the Snake, Green, and Shoshone. Though anglers in Wyoming can fish for a variety of warm water species, including the walleye and largemouth bass, the most abundant game fish are trout. Six different species of trout are established in the state. Most of Wyoming's streams are wild and unspoiled, but a few have been damaged by silt and pollution, and the department has worked hard to restore the habitat and replace rough species oh, with game fish. Still we in the slack water. To provide access for fishermen to waters on private lands, it has purchased easements from the landowners. It has restricted a few prime waters to catch and release fishing with artificial lures, so the trout populations can sustain themselves naturally but most other waters are regularly stocked with fingerling trout from hatcheries. The job of supplying those fingerlings requires 11 hatcheries and rearing stations. At this one, near the town of Auburn, six concrete raceways have a total capacity of 60,000 fish. To manage wildlife effectively, the department must keep the public informed about its work demonstrating that its programs and regulations are based not on politics, but on sound biological principles. It produces films and radio and TV shows, spreading the word in every way possible, as Information Officer Bill Brown explains. And we have to have public support. And the best way to get public support is to let them know what you're doing, especially if you're doing a good job, and I think we are. And to do this, we go to schools, we go to the state fair, we have a special summer camp uh, at Seville at the research unit where there's 40 students taking out 20 boys, 20 girls every year. And we have several men that travel throughout the state just, just giving talks and uh, working with children. And also you're talking about adults in education. We have a lot of new people coming to Wyoming. They need to learn about Wyoming. And for this, we go to service clubs, uh, meetings of any kind. We'll go most anywhere we're asked <laughs> and tell the people about Wyoming and what they can expect about Wyoming and its wildlife. And of course, tell them what our role is and what their responsibility is as well. But Wyoming has growing problems with energy development, air and water pollution, dams that destroy habitat, a human population rapidly increasing, and vast strip mines that remove the soil and vegetation and the wildlife that depends on them. In some areas, the migration routes of deer, elk, and antelope have been cut off by new highways, so these animals cannot reach their winter ranges. The Game and Fish Department cannot keep the human population from growing and demanding more energy, housing, and highways. But somehow, it must minimize the loss of wildlife and wildlife habitat. No one is more aware of this problem than John Turner who's a hunting outfitter and a state senator as well. We do have a good department. The questions that we as citizens have to ask is whether the tools they have today are going to be adequate for the future. And by that I mean uh, perhaps the management in the past, we've got by with what I like to call uh, passive benevolence. Uh, we've just had to worry about harvest levels and how many fish to put in the creel. And, but now with uh, pressures being put on the habitat, the wardens, the biologists in the field being completely overtaxed and overburdened, that uh, I think we're going to have to take some bold new approaches with some vision uh, on behalf of that department, on behalf of the habitat to meet the challenges of the future. Since 1937, the department has been financed almost entirely by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and not by appropriations from the legislature. But now its expenses are mounting dramatically. 
owing largely to its studies of energy and highway proposals and its detailed plans of ways to reduce their damage to wildlife. John Turner and many sportsmen say the legislature must provide a new source of funds and provide it with no political strings attached. The Wyoming Game and Fish Department has a long tradition of practical accomplishment and independence from politics, a tradition that deserves to be continued. If you ask me, Fritz Gresham, I say the wildlife of Wyoming is in mighty good hands. <laughs>